to a quite different realm next. It was a wonderful presentation on, on nutrition and everything, and I personally feel like I learned a lot. There was one slide where you had um, energy foods, and, uh, and in the middle there was a, an image of some mushrooms. I was like, yeah, croissants. Oh, oh no. <laughs> it wasn't croissants, it was a mushroom. Well, this is, this is my topic today, what neuroscience tells us about upgrading work and cognition. And my first take on the subject is that, well, probably not that much. Because neuroscience is always our cognitive neuroscience, which is my um, area of expertise, is focused on such specific questions and the, the results are, are so kind of small that it's a big step to applying the actual findings and somehow upgrading work based on these findings. But still, I'm going to give it a try. <laughs> I believe that because work is changing, we do need more information about how humans function, what is cognition, what is intelligence, what is thought. And I do feel that neuroscience can inform us about these things, but it's just really tricky to really directly apply neuroscience. So with that in mind, I thought we'd first look at work. <laughs> we'll really take a sort of philosophical stance on what work is, what does it require of us, which are the most important cognitive functions that we need in work nowadays. And then we'll look at targeting these cognitive functions. Is there a way to upgrade the thought processes that are most relevant at work? And I think I have some, some tips for you. They might not be from the realm of neuroscience, but there are some things we can all do to upgrade our thinking at work. So with that said, we'll, we'll um, get going. <laughs> so to upgrade work and cognition, we must first understand what work requ requires of us. It's, it's a big question. What is work? What kind of thinking does work require? And we need to do this before we can understand how how to sort of upgrade our thinking, how to influence our thinking, how to be better at work and create more value. So, work and cognition. There's a lot of discussion going on about how technology shapes work. And it's, it's in the headlines, there are these really, really sort of striking headlines of the rise of the robots, the onrushing wave of bits that is crushing us <laughs> beneath itself. And, and, and Bill Gates says that we're all going to lose our jobs, or at least like 50% or something, and, and we're becoming slaves to our, our, our robot overlords. And, and things like, you know, AI is like summoning the demon upon Earth. <laughs> so it's, I think it's fair to say that the discussion is quite polarized, it's, it's quite heated. But what is it that we're really talking about? What is really going on? How does technological advancement really change work? And I think the biggest implication is in what kind of, kinds of tasks should humans focus on? So if we're in the world where we have this kind of AI that can really more efficiently take care of repetitive tasks and closed-ended questions, then what should humans be concentrating on? So I thought we'd first take a look at this position, man versus machine. <laughs> are we really losing the game? Where are we now? What, what's the deal? Are we to worry about the being overtaken by robots? So when I saw this video, you're probably familiar with this, this <laughs> nifty robot. I, I got a little scared since it seems that we, we've lost chess to the robot. We're, we've been beaten at chess by robots. We've been beaten at, uh, was it Jeopardy, this sort of game show. We've also been beaten at rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> so this made me completely lose hope. <laughs> It's the most irritating robot out there. It's a combination of a high-speed camera and um, like uh, movement recognition. And it beats the human at rock, paper, scissors at um, a probability of 100%. <laughs> so all hope is gone. <laughs> all hope is lost. <laughs> We've definitely been beaten at this game, to say the least. And when you look at um, how AI is, is developing, it's quite concerning in some respects. This is a, a screen grab from this, this um, one of IBM's artificial intelligences, and they just do these things to sort of showcase what a AI could be um, capable of doing in the future. And they created this debating technology, so it's an artificial intelligence that is capable, you can just give it a topic, <laughs> any topic, in a few seconds, it will review four million articles <laughs> on the subject, find 3,000 sentences that are somehow relevant, the 10 most relevant articles, and it can, you know, it will suggest um, arguments against and, and for, for the topic you chose in just a matter of seconds. 
So um, as a researcher, <laughs> a big part of what I do is I go through the articles, and I had to, there's no way I could go through four million articles in a few seconds. So am I obsolete? <laughs> Am I out of a job in like two years when this will be in everyone's reach? I think not. I think there is a grave misunderstanding when we pose man versus machine and start thinking in this way in, in, in work. So as my friend Desko Kilpi said, work is not a zero-sum game. There is no um, finite amount of work that is divided between people in the world or that is divided between people and robots. Work stems from human need, from problems that need to be solved. There, there's, it's, it's not like a, there's not this finite quantity that just goes around and maybe some get left without. So we need to think about um, how we could be complemented by this digital intelligence, how we could complement our, our own thinking, our own work with these tools that are becoming available. And this is, a, this is research that, has, that was done in the 60s and it's been cited quite, quite recently very often. And um, I think it really nicely captures the world we are transferring into. So it's not a zero-sum game, it's not either or, it's not man versus machine. It's about how we can complement our own thinking. We should be thinking about what, what aspects of work we can concentrate on more because of these digital aids. What kinds of thinking does it liberate when we have these, these uh, amazing artificial intelligences to help us? So from man versus to machine, it's going to be man and machine. <laughs> and this is something that goes on every day. We're all already in this realm. So we're, we all, for example, supplement our memory with Google. You know, it's, it's an extension of our minds already, like, like it was reviewed in the previous talk. So it's there already, we just need to maybe find more sophisticated ways of using it. And maybe we haven't discovered all the ways that technology could aid us in our thinking. So what's the next step? <laughs> it's not man versus machine, it's not, maybe it's not even man and machine anymore. I think maybe the next step would be men and machines. So I think uh, my friend uh, Esko Kilpi, he told me that in chess, I think the story goes, so the first man was beaten by the chess machine. And then it, it became so that uh, man plus chess, chess machine was better than the chess, chess machine alone. But now it seems that even, even that was beaten by a chess machine. And now the latest development has been that a group of people working together with the chess, chess machines is <laughs> such a difficult word this early in the morning. <laughs> and uh, is better than the machine alone. So this is maybe the future, this human co cooperation, collaboration, joint intelligence and machines. So when we think about this, I think there's some important questions we should consider. Which, with digitally supplemented cognition, which, which aspects of work can we concentrate on more? What aspects of work will become highlighted when we have these amazing machines that can take care of repetitive tasks, easy questions. And as, as it was said in, in my introduction, work probably is becoming more complicated. It probably is becoming more difficult. It requires more thinking, more advanced problem solving than ever before, if all the easy problems are, are solved by artificial intelligence, for example. So it requires more of us than before. And this also means that it's not, not only on a, at an individual level, we need each other more than ever. We need to distribute the cognitive load of work because work is becoming more difficult. Um, what kinds of tasks and processes can we not outsource? What kinds of pro processes can we outsource? So where is the division? What kinds of things can be modeled with artificial intelligence and what cannot? And this is a question that I've, I've enjoyed asking a lot of audiences. And the things that people usually land on are stuff like, well, I can outsource quite a lot of my work, but interaction is one aspect that is really difficult to sort of, you know, leave to the computer. And some people say that create creativity, creative thinking is something that they could not outsource or with this really um, like difficult problem solving, these problems that there is no, no real answer, no real like predefined way of working. These are things that they could not outsource. 
So in my mind, maybe this is the thing, this is the, these are the three ideas that describe how work is changing. If we could outsource um, all of the other things to computers and AI, what would be left would be interaction, problem solving and creativity. So with that in mind, I pose that work is becoming learning intensive, work is becoming creative, and work is centering on interaction. And these are big words, <laughs> and they contain a lot of implications. But I would like to sort of focus on these three things when we start to think about, so what kinds of things does work require of humans? What kind of cognitive processes are most important? Because we need to move away from focusing on the tasks that, can, that will soon be automated and focusing on the things that, we, that are really human, that really require human input so we don't become obsolete <laughs> and lose our, our jobs to the robots. So, and the change is already visible. This isn't just like off the top of my head. We know that the service sector is growing, so interactive occupations are growing. We know that um, work is becoming more cognitive or more demanding, more about problem solving and non-routine. So if there's a routine in work, if you do something over and over again in the exact same way, it's going to be automated. <laughs> so the aspects of work that will become highlighted in the future are the non-routine aspects, the cognitive aspects. We also know that the internet provides this really, really cool platform for people to organize. It brings us together, it decreases the interaction costs or transaction costs. So we're maybe going from this world of companies selling to uh, groups of people or companies selling to other companies to just people interacting, <laughs> really organizing around different topics, different needs. And it's already happening. We're seeing that peer-to-peer -peer types of organizations are real, really challenging that the traditional ways of operating in business. They, are, they seem more easy for, easier for people to to assume they, they seem more flexible than the really typical hierarchical organization. So the more your business can sort of make interaction between customer and service provider easier, the more, uh, <laughs> the less this type of world will pose uh, as a challenge for you guys. So this is something we should definitely consider. So if this is the future of work, if it's more about interaction, if it's learning intensive, if it's creative, what kinds of cognitive skills are most important? I have a small taxonomy here. <laughs> I tried to think about what kinds of cognitive skills in general does work require. I came up with really, really typical psychological concepts like verbal ability, nonverbal ability, memory, working memory, of course. We need, these, we need attention to function at work. We need uh, the ability to combine and apply knowledge in different ways. Of course, we need interaction skills. We need learning ability. We need uh, creative thinking and this flexible contextual thinking. Now, based on what we saw that's happening in, with AI and, and robotics and automation, which of these do you think that we should be concentrating on? <laughs> and which of these skills are, are things that, you know, we've lost the game at? <laughs> which of these things, you know, probably the computer is better than the people. So in my mind, we should definitely be concent concentrating on these four skills, interaction skills, learning, creative thinking, and this flexibility of thought. And there are, again, big words. Even if we just dive into what interaction skills are, we get into topics like social cognition, which is just a gigantic realm and, and field of research on its own. It mostly concentrates on this, or I like to think that it mostly concentrates on this construct called empathy. <laughs> and you know, it's a pink background, I'm talking about empathy, and <laughs> but try to stick with it. It's so important, especially when we think about if work is interaction, what makes interaction uh, efficient? It's empathy. And empathy contains stuff like you know, emotion expression, recognition, emotion understanding, mentalizing ability, so you're able to sort of um, imagine what, what he might be thinking while he's looking at my slide and not smiling at all. <laughs> Theory of mind, so you're able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and, and experience what they're experiencing, and these mirroring mechanisms of the brain, for example. So it's a whole big realm, and we have very little information about, for example, the neural basis of these functions. 
but that's something I'm very interested in myself. So I think that these would be the future work skills. Increase your empathy, be better at work. <laughs> so in sum, in work we should be concentrating on developing the skills that really ultimately define value creation in this era with highly efficient AI, with automation and robotics. And there are skills that permit this enriching interaction, for example, with clients. Creative thinking, responsive thinking. We live in such a complex world that the, the, the process doesn't work anymore. And strategic thinking can sometimes blind us from what is really happening around us. So, that's where work is going. <laughs> and these are the kind of skills that I think will be most important very nearly in the future. Uh, so based on this, what are the key steps in supporting cognitive function at work, this kind of cognitive function? And, and what do we know really about these most important functions like creativity? It's such an obscure concept in, on its own. So I have a short, the upgrade <laughs> section for you here. And I think it's uh, th basically a three-step process. <laughs> Personally, I hate these kinds of five steps to success or <laughs> do these three things and you'll be, a, you know, you'll be a superhuman, but I still have one for you here. So, of course, we need a brain. We need to take care of brain health. And there's been a lot of good talk about supporting health in general, and all of that applies to the brain as well. The next step is taking care of basic cognition, that we're able to use the brain since we have it. And then the third step, in my mind, would be the true upgrade. Is I have some, um, some studies there and some, uh, some opinions there about how you could really take your thinking towards this, this next level of creative, interactive processing and problem solving. So brain health, it's really simple, and we all know this. It's healthy habits equal a healthy brain. And it's the basics that you really need to take care of. It's, it's sleep, food, stress management, exercise, and learning. These take care of your brain. And for example, about sleep, we have these studies where they found that chronic sleep deficiency results in brain tissue loss. <laughs> so it's, it's neurotoxic, chronic sleep deficiency. And about stress management, there are these studies where they found that chronic occupational stress also results in brain tissue loss. So you really need to take care of this. And sometimes I find that in work organizations, we have this, this culture of, of sort of soldiering on, like the good worker is the one who really like, um, Pushes the pushes his boundaries and works for hours and like they must be talking hasn't been really sleeping in the past four weeks Well, he's probably experienced some loss of brain tissue them so <laughs> Might explain a few things <laughs> But don't worry of course exercise is really really um, one way to sort of counter the effects and and learning There are these really interesting studies of learning and neurogenesis that you could um since new neurons are born, I think it's like every two weeks or something in the brain, and if they don't get used, they die away. So learning is the only way to save and perhaps use these new neurons that are produced in the brain. So learning is a way to maybe, maybe combat this, <laughs> this loss of tissue that happens maybe from stress or, or sleep deficiency. And food, of course, the, the relationship between food, amount of food, the quality of food and cognitive functions is really complex. And I'm not going to go into that. There are better experts here. So that's the first step, that we have a brain. <laughs> and we work in a way that makes sure that we don't lose that much brain tissue. That's the first step. Second step is knowing how to use the brain. So basic cognition. And I've, I've um, sort of termed it focus. So that's a really basic thing that our brain does. And it's called executive functions. It's a terrible concept, <laughs> very vague. But in, um, in short, in, it contains these three components. It's about inhibitory control. So you have this impulse control. You know how to concentrate. You know how to stick to a subject when you start. It's also cognitive flexibility, so you're able to shift strategy according to different needs. And it's also about working memory, so these three concepts. And it's basically, you have this internal boss <laughs> that sort of manages your attention, manages your resources. It's the basic, basic stuff you need to be able to handle if you want to be in, in charge of your brain. And executive functions are disturbed in a variety of conditions, like stress, um, burnout, depression, all kinds of things really interfere with executive functions. And um, 
So, with this in mind, I've been reading, it's really interesting that there are these um, experiments on non-invasive brain stimulation that have, have been found to have an effect, especially on working memory. And I think that the, the study of working memory is coming up because it's so easy to measure. <laughs> So we have these studies that are looking at how, for example, transcranial alternate, alternating current stimulation or direct current stimulation could, could somehow increase working memory. And it is true, they have pretty, pretty amazing results of improving working memory from like four to, one to four items. So that's quite incredible and it seems that the effects might last. But then when you look at um, reviews on the subject, on this brain stimulation, it's not so clear cut. So some reviews are very positive, about the, the promises of this brain stimulation, and then some are just like, you know, we don't really know. Effects are really non-specific. Effects vary from individual to individual. So there's not, no real consensus. And I think that most of the reviews are, <laughs> see mo most promise in, in treating people with actual deficiencies in working memory, actual problems with the brain, like after a stroke or something like that. So the general view is mixed. There, it's possible that people here know a little bit more about this stimulation business than, than I do, but this is my, my view on the topic. And then we have, <laughs> I did some Googling on the topic on this brain stimulation. I, please tell me, is this, this page like for real? <laughs> because this, this guy was going on like, um, he's very convinced of the brain boosting powers of direct current stimulation and he's, uh, he's devised this cap himself and he's like, well, like, what's the next step? You know, where could we implant these, these electrodes in the brain? And of course, the ventricles, the, the fluid filled spaces in the brain, it's just that they're not big enough. <laughs> and then he suggests that we start, you know, if you're really into biohacking the brain, you need to start enlarging your, <laughs> your skull and somehow like stretching it so that the, the brain fits in. So it can get quite crazy. Just know that there are other things you can do to develop your executive functions. You can, you know, yoga, mindfulness. <laughs> you don't need to zap your brain, music training even. There's a lot of ways to sort of in, like support cognitive functioning, support working memory, support all kinds of executive functions. It's not all about zapping the brain. Well, then the true upgrade. I would like to um, point out that even if you're able to increase your working memory by four items, is that really going to make you a better worker in, an, in this digital age with you know, amazing artificial intelligence and, and these robots that take care of all the, the manual tasks for you? In this age where we have these, these um, machines that are capable of re reviewing like thousands of articles in a few seconds. Is working memory really the thing that's going to make you not lose your job to a robot? <laughs> so I think that sometimes we're, we're focusing on the things that are measurable, and the things that are measurable might not be too simple. They might not be the right things. They might not be the most important functions. So the true upgrade, in my opinion, would come, on, come from um, increasing quality of learning increasing creativity and increasing um, cap capabilities for interaction at work. So I have a few minutes left and I'll just bring, point out a few things about each of the three. So learning. The most th important thing about learning is, and this is not neuroscience, <laughs> is that learning requires not knowing. And I feel that sometimes experts get stuck in their own knowledge. And especially if, we're, if we have these artificial intelligences that can just consume and apply massive amounts of information, you're going to be screwed if you really if you just fall in love with how much you know, because you know, it won't, just won't cut it anymore in the future. And it's been really nicely portrayed. I think Saku put this on Facebook yesterday. <laughs> is the expert level is you think you know a lot <laughs> for a while. <laughs> it's just the amount of information in any case is so huge that it, it won't save you. Absorbing a lot of information won't be the thing that will make you relevant in, in work, occupational life in the future. Another cartoon artist described this, the problem with expertise as Mount Stupid. <laughs> So, hope I'm not, you know, hollering from the top right now, <laughs> posing as an expert here. So we need to stop knowing things. That's the only path we can take towards really learning new stuff. It's just such a nice feeling to have, because human life is so complex. It's such a rewarding feeling to think that, yeah, at least this much I know. <laughs> at least this is, this I'm sure of. 
And we also know that um, from actual research <laughs> that inconsistent performance may signal learning. Yet in work organizations we're like, yeah, consistent performer, good guy, he's a really good employee. But does that mean the person is not learning? Because if that's so, then it's a terrible waste for the whole, whole cooperation, the company. We also know that confusion can support learning. <laughs> this was a study done where there were two groups of people, and one group was given very neat, very sort of coherent information on a topic. Other group was given really contradictory information on a topic. And the group that had to handle the really contradictory information learned a lot more, and their attitudes toward learning were a lot better. So how to increase learning? Do you know what you don't know? <laughs> Are you curious? It's, I think it's more about a mindset, this learning business, than, than the capability. Are you brave enough to not know? Because not knowing is, is in this day with experts coming at you from all types of media, it's really scary to say, I don't know. <laughs> Will you be less valued if you say that you don't know something? And do you, can you stand failure and an inconsistent performance from yourself? I quite recently started dancing again, and um, I have to tell you, I'm not used to failing <laughs> as an adult, and, and the, the classes are just this really, <laughs> really sort of a roller coaster of emotions going from this extreme frustration to, to joy. But it's just, it's a lot to bear, like seeing yourself fail and failing over and over again, especially as an adult, and especially as someone who maybe thinks of themselves an expert in some way. Second point, increase creativity. So what is the brain basis of creativity? It's such a difficult topic, but at least we know it's not this. <laughs> if there's one take-home message from this talk, it's not this. <laughs> Come on. As the, the systemic view of, of humans has been up this morning already, so it's more complicated than that. If you're interested, there's one paper. But what we do know is that there are these networks that may be related to creativity. There's this default mode network and a task positive network. <laughs> and uh, it's been found that this default mode network, that's on when you're not focusing, when you're just left your mind drift, when you have no goal in mind, is connected to greater creativity. So how to do this? Make time for relaxation. Value daydreaming and renew your understanding of what efficiency is. Usually at the workplace where like the efficient person is 100% concentrated, 100% <laughs> like on the ball all the time for hours, you know, they drink the rishi and whatever. <laughs> they just stay on the task all the time. But if we need more creativity, then we should make room for this sort of daydreaming, daydreaming aspect. It's a big challenge. Last bit, interaction. Now this is a big topic. There are these quite, um, these new views of, uh, at least in neuroscience, new views of how cognition actually emerges in interaction. And it, it's really easy to understand. It's valueless if it's just contained within an individual. Cognition means something when it happens in interaction, when it influences others. And so there's this whole new field of two-person neuroscience where you, they use hyper-scanning experiments. There's a mom and a kid in the MRI, <laughs> and they somehow track what happens actually between people as they interact. Really exciting research going on. And some findings are that, for example, the rhythmic activity of, in people's brains synchronizes when we work together, and that the coherence is increased by cooperation and decreased by competition. And still we're like, yeah, competition brings out the best talent. So that's something I'd really love for work co company or companies or work organizations to renew in their thinking. How to do this? I think we come back to empathy. Empathy is, is the one thing that you can sort of rely on. It's the one thing that really increases the quality of interaction. We don't know so much about it. We don't know how to hack it yet, maybe. <laughs> but this is maybe something you should be following, something you should sort of ask yourself about. Is there a way you could be more present in interaction in a richer way? And also think about who supplements your thinking. Who are the people you should find to work with? Who takes your cognition forward? So those were the three steps. <laughs> Three steps to success, <laughs> really big topics. All in all, a huge topic, 
And um, I guess the final words would be, since we're going towards this kind of world, with AI, with robotics, with you know, automation, we're, the work we're doing is getting a lot more difficult. Well, luckily, we have a lot of research about how people function, how the brain functions. And what would happen if we really used this information in work organizations to hack the organization, to hack your own thinking? From this aspect, I think it's really promising. Thank you. <laughs>